they got them and um, what they what it's like in a day in the life of their daily jobs. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. So first we have Dr. Gilbrook, who is a professor here at, at UCF. He teaches the GIS classes and recently has become an environmental studies professor as well. Um, and he also works as a geospatial professional at HDR. And then next Hi. we have... Next, we have Amy Pastor, who is a principal at EXP, which is a architecture and consulting firm, and then she's director of commissioning and sustainability for them, as well as the USGBC Central Florida Chair, which is uh, the United States Green Building Council. Hello. And then lastly, we have Dr. Brittany Sellers, who is a sustainability project manager for the city of Orlando. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. All right. So we're going to basically the format for today, we're going to ask all the panelists a few questions and then at the end we'll have a q a portion and then any of the students here you guys can just um, put in the questions in the chat and then we'll go one by one down the chat and try and answer as many questions as we can all right so first the question is how has the field changed in the past five years and what do you predict will happen in the next five to ten years um dr gilbrook if you'd like to go and answer first thank you um I think one of the biggest changes that's happened in the last uh, five years or so has been, you know, for many years, unfortunately, we've had a politicization of the issues of climate change um, and uh, in particular, and sustainability uh, has been kind of caught up with that. Uh, we had a number of uh, uh, local governments uh, and state governments even that were denying um, uh, the, the actuality of, of climate change and, you know, refusing to allow um, their staff to use that term or use the term global warming or sea level rise. I think what we're seeing is the reality of, of uh, the changes in the environment are catching up with people. They're realizing that uh, um, you cannot hold back the tide, you know, that uh, your political views don't make a difference to the planet. So what we're seeing is a lot of local governments uh, uh, suddenly uh, 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 being a lot more serious about uh, taking sea level rise and climate change factors into account. Um, I think over the next five to 10 years, um, if we uh, have uh, better leadership, uh, particularly at the, at the uh, uh, federal level on down uh, to uh, 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 address uh, the issues of uh, climate change uh, and uh, uh, more seriously, uh, you're gonna see a big increase in the number of cities, counties, and states that are looking to adopt uh, climate change action plans and uh, uh, reduce their greenhouse gas footprint. So there's gonna be a lot of interest in, in, in doing that kind of work, uh, but we're already seeing like city of Orlando is a great example of, of uh, you know, uh, a city that has invested a lot uh, in trying to reduce their, uh, their emissions footprint. And I think we're only gonna see more of that. Awesome, uh, Ms. Pastor, would you like to answer the question? Yes, and I'm actually going to just leapfrog right on to what uh, Dr. Gilp said, because, you know, my background is engineering, and what we have seen significantly change in the last five years is people actually implementing what has been in the code for probably the last 10 years. It's, you know, certain authorities having jurisdictions can can implement or not implement what has been written, but from an engineering standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, and then commissioning, which is making sure the building systems are operating as they should, has really been um, pushed to the forefront to make sure that we are addressing climate change through energy reductions or through you know, making sure our buildings are better. And in the next five to 10, 10 years, I really see that continuing, um, but also really pushing for decarbonization, electrification in, you know, some cities talk about electrification and when you're in a different climate than say Florida, when you're looking over in California and they're using a lot of gas for um, their heating, you're going to start to see people try to move to electric and then also really try to be resilient and um, find ways to, to implement microgrids or battery storage to allow for resiliency in their buildings and in their sites. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Dr. Sellers? 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and also kind of uh, piggyback um, off of those great remarks. Um, in terms of working in local government, we've certainly seen um, not only our city, but others catalyzed by the lack of leadership that we've seen at the federal level for the last four years, uh, particularly withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, um, as well as some other changes and rollbacks regarding policies. Um, and instead of being um, discouraged by all of this. Instead, a lot of cities have taken a leadership role. We've established a climate mayors program that over 500 mayors across the US in varying political uh, environments have joined and are moving forward together to develop sustainability and resilience plans. There's a commitment called We Are Still In um, and the fact that the majority of our population live in cities. Um, and the mayors of some of our largest cities are taking this very seriously and are still maintaining commitments that are in alignment with the Paris Accord, like the under two MOU is another, or Ready for 100, which was Sierra Club's campaign uh, to commit to 100% renewable energy that we did in the city of Orlando, and that we continue to work and share best practices with our peers. And if there's something that's a uh, an opportunity or a great success in one city, we can just share it with others and kind of build from those successes. So I think that has been a big shift um, from the local government perspective. And I think uh, beyond that, just with sustainability at large, I've seen improved messaging um, across the board, trying to get a better sense of what really motivates humans to change their behaviors, as well as better design, um, which is really close to my heart. And I know we'll talk about our backgrounds a little bit later um, to make some of these behaviors easier. Um, so not just bleeding heart campaigns, but more intuitive design. Um, again, there's certainly the incorporation of climate resilience that is becoming more and more of a focus. Um, and then those improved metrics and really tying some of these commitments and campaigns um, that we've made and even our plans to the metrics that are determining how well we're moving the needle across each of these strategies and how much of a difference it's going to make. Um, and I think the last point that I have, um, much to my delight um, and for the sake of diversity, is that we have more and more women in the field. And we've seen that in our office and beyond, um, which is incredibly valuable um, and from what I've seen, highly supportive. Yeah, that's definitely very true. It's great to see you also. All right, and I'll tackle the next question. But first, um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but Emma, of course, is our Director of Innovation for SGA. And um, I'm a graduate student at UCF, also UCF alumni, and I'm just helping out today. But as we're, you're, you are all students, whether you're in undergrad or graduate school, and a lot of us still don't know exactly what field of sustainability we want to go in. So I guess the question we have for our panelists, because we're asking about their jobs, uh, what is the biggest risk you ever took in your career and what did you learn from it? We can go with, uh, let's go with Dr. Sellers first. Okay, thanks, Judy. Um, this, uh, my story is a little bit of a garden path variety. Um, so I, it will help, I think, to provide a little bit more background now. And then in perhaps in a future question, I can hang back a little bit more. Um, my background is actually in psychology. I got my bachelor's at Flagler College in St. Augustine. And then I pursued my master's and PhD from University of Central Florida, so I'm a Knight as well, um, and focused on human factor psychology. So really with a focus on ergonomics and design. Um, particularly regarding elements of the built environment. So when you put humans in a specific space, how do they behave? Um, I initially was working for TSA um, with the airport screening test, improving their ability to uh, catch some of these threat items. I worked for the Army. Um, I worked for a number of agencies that are completely different um, from the work that I do now. Um, and in my research lab, Integrating sustainability wasn't really anywhere on our agenda, but thankfully I had a mentor who was very supportive of this. So I essentially did double duty for a while and I did what I was paid to do in my lab by day and by night had my passion project in sustainability. Uh, doing extra work while working on your PhD um, is a risk I think, in terms of mental health among other things. Um, but I eventually created enough uh, momentum and got published um, enough times that I had uh, you know, some foundation to stand on and then reached out uh, to the office of it's now uh, UCF Sustainability Initiatives um, with a grant proposal. Um, I won a fellowship that came out around the same time and I essentially piece together an opportunity to complete my dissertation on sustainability, particularly regarding energy behaviors, 
Um, and this is completely different from my field, very inconvenient for a lot of the individuals involved. And I've always been a bit of a teacher's pet, like some of us were joking before the call got started today. Um, I've never had any level of disagreement with any um, academic or authority figure, but I ultimately had to do something that was quite inconvenient for the others involved, um, as long as I had some clout and funding and a way to make it happen. And ultimately their support um, that was provided because of all the hard work that they saw me demonstrate. And I was able to complete my dissertation in a really um, non-traditional way. And ultimately, it led me to where I am. So at the time, it felt very disconcerting and different. Um, but I realized it's just important to ask for what you want and figure out a way to get it um, and try to earn that respect in the meantime. But don't expect that it's going to be given to you um, until you have something to show. Completely agree with that. All right, let's move on to Ms. Pastor. Well, uh so the biggest risk I ever took in my career was actually getting into sustainability. And I am, as I had mentioned, I, you know, I am an engineer. I hold a bachelor and master's degree in architectural engineering from Penn State University. And our focus was primarily, or you know, my focus was uh, the mechanical design. So I started my career at, EXP has been multiple different names with, that's another story. <laughs> but over the course of 15 years, it's changed. But at EXP, when I started, I actually did design for high-end hospitality resorts in the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, so when you're looking at Anguilla, the British West Indies, uh, the Virgin Islands, energy is 35 cents a kilowatt hour compared to we pay 10 or 11 cents like just to kind of put it in scales. And this is back in, you know, 15 years ago when I started. So we always designed sustainability sustainably. Um, but I was an engineer, you know, it was a, a set job. I knew what I was going to do. Engineering, you need engineers, you, you, nine to five job. And then I met, and Brittany is going to know this name right at the top of the bat. Um, there was a gentleman at my company named Mike Hess who was running our sustainability group. And I went through um, an economic downturn in my time, in my career, and we laid off about half of the company. And I was very fortunate to keep my job. And one of the reasons was I had helped with some energy modeling. There was a building that was going for this thing called LEED. And LEED was not as streamlined as it is today and sustainability in the US was not as, you know, the, as a buzzword as it is today. And Mike reached out and said, I, I need some help. We're busy. Biz everybody wants to be sustainable. They want to save money. And how do you save money? You got to save energy. You got to build more, more buildings smarter if you want to you know, build your portfolio. So I raised my hand and I completely stepped out of my comfort zone and said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to leave engineering, same, still same company. I said, I really want to go to this other group and I'm going to do energy modeling and I'm going to do lead checklists and I'm going to do water calcs. And oh my gosh, what am I getting into? Biophilia? What is, what's a plant? Like I, uh, I was math, 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 science, science, science. And, you know, very fortunate for me, we talk about mentors, but Mike really stepped up to mentor and he sponsored me. And I actually took over his position when he's at the city of Orlando now, which is why I say Brittany knows him and is an amazing advocate for all things sustainability. But he saw my, you know, he saw a passion in me and my design and really helped me um, embrace it and step completely out of my comfort zone and take a huge risk, but also provided me with that support and help to get me to where I am today. Yes, changing your industry is always really scary and a big risk. Let's move on to Dr. Gilbrook. What's the biggest risk you ever took in your career and what did you learn? You know, I, I think my, my story uh, has some parallels with the other two. We've heard that, you know, that there was a bifurcation, you know, in, in the career path I could take. The, uh, 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 I graduated from uh, uh, University of Central Florida, so also an alumni. Uh, with a master's degree in biological science, became an environmental scientist uh, with the uh, state of Florida. Did that for almost five years and then became an environmental planner working for a regional planning agency with the Regional Planning Council here in the Orlando area. Did that for another eight years. So I had, at, at the end of that, uh, 12 years of environmental science and planning experience. And then I had an opportunity to either become uh, the uh, uh, chief environmental planner for uh, a, a county in the Central Florida area, 
or I was being offered a position to be an environmental planner and GIS professional for a private sector firm. And you know, looking at it, you know, when you looked at the, the 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 salary and the benefits and all those kinds of uh, things, the positions were almost identical. Um, you know, and so I had the the choice of okay, I've already been doing work at the government level. I like that. I feel like I'm making a difference. I'm making a, a you know a, a, I'm contributing to uh, uh, you know in a in a sense to this you know uh, uh, benefiting the public overall. I could still do that as as the chief planner, uh, environmental planner for this this county, but I saw an opportunity at the private sector firm to sort of widen my scope because they were a, a national and they're now a global firm uh, and they were doing a lot of projects where I thought I could make a difference. And, and the reality has turned out, I think I've made a difference that my presence on some projects has meant, at least in my view, that they turned out perhaps more environmentally sound that they might have had been with somebody else. You know, I'm sure they would have done fine, but uh, you know, I, I think I was able to make key differences sometimes on projects because I was there at the time decisions were being made uh, on some sort of environmental study that we were doing for a city or a county or a state government. Um, and uh, one of the things I liked about this firm that I'm working for is that its clients are almost 100% uh, public. So we don't do, you know, subdivision development, you know, it's all public works projects. Um, and uh, so you're, you're, you're still working in the public interest, but you're, you're trying to ensure that it's done in an environmentally sound way. Awesome, thank you all so much. It was really interesting to hear. And for the next question, do you think that COVID-19 will have a positive or a negative impact on the field in terms of employment? And we can go with Mrs. Faster to start since you haven't gone first yet. Great, the, the, the question of the day that I get to start with. No, this is, um, you know what? I'm gonna be honest. I think, um, I think it's gonna have a positive impact. And I say this because I, everybody on this phone, all the students, you know, there's some graduate, but a lot of undergraduates. I didn't have a cell phone when I went to college. It was not a thing that like, you didn't just carry it in your pocket and you can be on the computer and be looking things up all the time. You had to physically make a connection with somebody in person. And because we, we used to sit in our offices and I felt like, you know, day to day, I was interacting with people that were, you know, two feet down the hall for me through email or I wasn't interacting with them face to face. And since COVID, I have had more conversations and yeah, they're not in person, but people are turning their cameras on and people are engaging with each other more often and picking up a phone and calling versus sending a Teams message or a Skype message or an email because they want that human interaction that, that we've been missing. And I really believe that this is going to have a positive impact on employment because people are more social. People, I think the social skills that may have been missed a little bit you know, throughout the, the electronic age where we doing a lot of things by email and not in person. I think we're getting back to um, making human connections again. And I really feel like it's going to help um, just in that social aspect and really, you know, making a difference when you're giving your resume and speaking to somebody. And I think the skills are gonna be developed more for our up and coming students. That's definitely a very positive outlook. I, I, that's great. Um, Dr. Gilbert, you can go ahead and go next. Uh, yeah, I, this is a tough one. I think the, the results on this are gonna be mixed. Um, you know, one of the things that we've already heard uh, in the urban planning field, people are beginning to freak out over whether or not the, the trends we've seen with COVID-19, having people work from home, work from their offices, you know, like that's what I'm doing right now. I'm at, I'm at, I'm at home and, uh, and I think, for most of the panel is. And um, so that's worked out really great. I mean, we're really lucky that the, the second pandemic to occur in a hundred years happened during a time where we had the technical ability to be able to work from home and have uh, a video and, and voice connection uh, with our coworkers. Um, you know, if this had happened 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been feasible. But we've had concerns that could this be the death of the city? Over the last 20 years or so, we've seen a renaissance in downtowns where people are realizing, hey, uh, you know, we'd rather live downtown, we'd rather be in a place that's walkable, we'd rather be in a place with mass transit, uh, we'd, you know, we'd rather be in a place where there's lots of things going on right around the corner. 
And so downtowns have really had a renaissance in the last 20 years or so. And there's a lot of concern uh, in the urban planning community as to whether or not this will mean decentralization. And once again, people will have no reason to come downtown. Will that mean, you know, and we're already seeing this to some extent that some businesses are shuttering because they're finding that it's cheaper to have their workforce stay at home and everybody work like this. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of torn on this. Um, I am working at home because uh, uh, I, uh, it's, I don't feel it's safe enough yet to go back to the office for me personally, but at the same time, I hate it because <laughs> uh, uh, I really like, like, like Amy says, I really prefer to actually be, you know, in a situation where I can actually uh, uh, meet other people and, and, and be in that, that environment. So um, I don't think we know really what COVID-19 is going to do to uh, work in general, much less work in the in the sustainability field. One thing I think it might do for sustainability is actually reduce the amount of time we think we need to spend in the office. I think even after uh, the disease is behind us, I think uh, a lot of companies are gonna downsize the amount of space they allocate for, for in office workers, and that, that at least everybody will spend some part of their week working from home. I think, I think we'll have a lot fewer people showing up to the office every day. I think that's that's something we could probably count on because they'll just find it's, hey, it's easier. Why have so many square feet of office space when we could have a much smaller office space footprint and send some people, you know, home every week? Yeah, that's definitely true. And I've already read a lot about that as well. Um, Dr. Sellers, would you like to answer? Yes, I think um, on that note regarding finding a balance there between human interaction and opportunities to connect virtually and how one draws the other. Um, it might be something we take for granted and then we miss, but we actually are uh, taking better advantage of some of those opportunities um, to speak. And so I do think that there's an interesting balance there. And it's certainly something that in my exposure and working with the city, I've seen reflected in terms of our approach to urban development, um, specifically regarding smart high density development. And rather than focusing on a singular downtown, um, instead incorporating a neighborhood approach. So we have um, in the city of Orlando, these main street programs you might see. So Mills 50 was one of our first. Uh, we have Soto, we have a few areas and it's essentially they're like these little villages. Ideally over time, we continue to integrate sustainability and they become more like eco villages. Um, but Baldwin Park is a great example or Lake Nona um, where they're designed uh, with sustainability in mind um, with an opportunity to be close to your neighbors but outside of a traditional urban downtown high-rise environment you have your grocery stores and your pharmacy and entertainment all right there but it's not too far away from also mass transit or ability to connect to some of these other neighborhoods as well um, and in Lake Nona for example a high portion I want to say it's about 20 percent or more of their population did telecommuting or flex schedules some if not all of the time prior to the pandemic and so some of those individuals might not be in that medical space that's uh, located in that particular particular region, um, but they're able to avoid commuting every day because it's essentially built into their space. Um, so I think there are going to be more opportunities for that where you can ultimately just find a balance between being near what you'd like, um, but also having an opportunity um, to, you know, step away from what might be considered as a traditional downtown core. Um, in terms of employment, I think right now uh, we kind of saw the initial whiplash of challenges in terms of the impacts on the economy. A lot of our uh, commercial partners are not thinking of energy efficiency as their top strategy. They're really just trying to continue to exist. Um, and in the long term, what we're trying to propose, uh, like Amy mentioned earlier, is saving money in the long term. It's making wiser investments, it's lowering utility and operating costs, um, but it's a matter of reframing that, which is what I found in talking with my uh, peers in other cities is, kind of holding back in this initial panic mode and then following back up and saying, if you're gonna to continue to use your space in whatever way you might be flexing now in the new normal, here's an opportunity to cut down on costs, improve your air quality, retain tenants, make people feel safer um, in those particular spaces. And we're starting to see individuals making improvements in the spaces where they're staying. So in terms of residential home improvements, we've seen a number of um, different improvements being made and it could be from replacing AC units, which 
which makes sense over the summer if you're staying home all the time, but also solar panel installations um, and just a number of improvements being made across the home environment. And that's not just for high income individuals who are looking to getting around to revamping their space. It's also um, being demonstrated in some of our lower income families as well um, with the number of financing programs we've provided to them to make it more affordable. Um, so across the board, I really think it's going to be um, sustainability is going to be considered more of a long term strategy and it intersects really nicely with climate resilience, which we're seeing more of we're being more mindful of uh, the changes that we're seeing at the weather patterns and climate at large, some of the social justice issues that we're seeing as well public health green jobs. Um, we're really at the center of all of those different opportunities going forward. So as we start to shift as a society, I think we're going to be central, um, but I think we need to be strategic and mindful in how we approach that. Thank you, Brittany. I do think that our students are probably very concerned with uh, employment opportunities, especially during COVID. Uh, Emma, if you could go to the next question. So for a lot of our students, because they're um, doing remote learning, um, a lot of the experiential learning and service learning courses don't offer in person anymore. So how do you recommend students emerge or emerging professionals to further their education and experience outside of the classroom uh, during the changes faced we uh, face from COVID-19? Uh, let's go with Dr. Gilbrook. Yeah, this is another toughie because uh, I, I'm seeing this right now with um, I'm teaching the Foundations in Environmental Studies course that has actually a requirement for service learning project. And uh, many of the, the uh, sustainability organizations that students might otherwise have volunteered with have really restricted their ability for students to actually volunteer in person. Some of them haven't, but, but many of them have. Um, and we know that many of the internship programs at, um, at, at, at both uh, private sector and, and government institutions you know, uh, some of them ha are still going along, but, you know, many of them have been curtailed, you know, for the duration. So, so there are fewer opportunities, I think, for students to get um, outside experience. Um, but um, that's not to say there's none. I mean, there, there are some op opportunities where students can participate, um, you know, still remotely, just like, you know, all the other office workers do uh, at the organization, uh, many of them working remotely. Um, uh, as we're getting better experience with working with COVID-19 in the office and redesigning our interior spaces so that you can socially distance and, and, and the like, you know, at the office, you know, some of those internship programs may come back. Um, one thing that occurs to me is that there's a lot of opportunities to, you, to uh, enroll in uh, the uh, uh, various MOOCs, the massively online uh, courses that uh, are offered. So, um, if you're looking for something beyond your 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 traditional coursework, um, you know uh, there's there's a lot of uh, opportunities in in these uh, courses, and and they're you know they're typically you know not for any kind of credit, it's just for personal uh, uh, experience and edification. Um, you could you can sign up for a course, and it's just done completely online, uh, and it's a good way to to either learn a new skill. Uh, there's a lot of GIS courses, for example, that are taught as MOOCs. Uh, or if it's just a new uh, an, an area of interest that, that uh, you just uh, haven't had an opportunity to pursue uh, in college, um, you know these things are often taught at night, uh, or they're taught uh, asynchronously, so you can you can log in anytime you like. So so that might be one opportunity if you're just trying to expand your uh, your interest. Awesome, thank you. Um, an example of that could be, I'm sure most of you have heard it via YouTube ads, but Skillshare is one of those platforms where people can learn remotely and they do have a lot of coupons out there. So you can do like free month or free two months. So you don't have to pay anything. And a lot of those technical skills like AutoCAD or um, Photoshop, you can learn online. And that's one of those skills you don't necessarily have to take a full class um, enrolling in a class at UCF for, but you can still have that skill on your resume. But moving on, let's go with uh, Ms. Pastor. Great, thank you. And I actually took that question a little bit differently because I read it as um, experiences outside of the classroom, meaning not sitting and learning from a book. Um, and my, so my answer is was going to be is that you really need to collaborate with 
peers in the industry. And I say peers because there's so many people who want to compete against each other. And I'll say my best friends and my best collaborations come from the call it the quote unquote competition, the name of the company versus the name of the company. And I'm like, I'm trying this on a project. What do you think? And it's that collaboration. And, you know, for, as an emerging professional, I really encourage you guys to look at USGBC at ASHRAE if you're an engineer and really just talk with people in the industry because they can help you. I learned more in the first six months of my job than I did in all five years at school. And it's not saying that I didn't have a great established base of the, the you know, the X plus Y equals Z. It was that when you are in a job and you're collaborating with people, it, you just, you're learning and your capacity to learn right after college is just exponential. So I would say, start getting involved with your local USGBC, ASHRAE, other organizations, and really collaborate with your peers and don't think of them as enemies, think of them as, as peers. Yeah, can I jump in? And, and I think Amy made a really good point there about professional organizations. And, and uh, there is a local chapter of the Central Florida Association of Environmental Professionals, uh, but there's also a student chapter of that organization that meets on campus. So. Uh, I think Amy's exactly right that, uh, 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 and I ignored it totally in my answer, that working with professional organizations, you, you end up getting cross-fertilized with a lot of ideas from people that are in your field, but maybe doing something slightly different or doing something entirely different that you've never really uh, been exposed to before. And um, uh, it, it's a really great opportunity. So um, either the Florida Association or the local UCF chapter of the Florida Association of environmental professionals, a highly recommended uh, both of those. Thank you both. And if you're looking for clubs on UCF, um, a lot of them have moved to virtual meetings, so they're easier to meet and also safe social distance. Um, that's a great opportunity to get more involved with on campus things as well. All right, let's move to Dr. Sellers. Um, I can kind of keep it brief because so many great points have already been made, uh, but I think uh, if you're interested in really taking this seriously and going the next step, um, use this opportunity to get ahead of the curve and uh, look into LEED certification or becoming a true advisor for zero waste or a climate change professional. Um, these all have online opportunities, modules and training resources. And um, to some extent, I can't speak for all of them where they are right now post COVID, um, but I think the majority of them have an online opportunity or ability to do so, take the test in an isolated environment. Um, so there's a great opportunity for um, students to look into those programs and get that student discount while you're still in school um, for taking some of those certifications. And then uh, just continuing to do your own research online. I learned an incredible amount just by going through the databases that UCF has in terms of their academic journals. And if I had a question, just looking up some of those terms and figuring out who had studied it and what had they done and what else I might wanna add to it. And I reached out by email to a lot of different academics across the world, just saying, hey, I really like your study. I'm interested in doing this. Can you tell me that? And that's something that at this point really hasn't changed, you know, having that access to those things as well. Um, and looking into something that you're interested in, just doing a basic search and saying, if you want to know what the city of Orlando is doing, look up city of Orlando sustainability. And we have a point of contact assigned to all the different work that we do. And don't be afraid to ask questions um, to get a better sense of, you know, what you're interested in and what you might want to do and opportunities to get involved, including remote opportunities. Awesome. Yeah, that's very true. And I'm studying for the lead exam myself right now because uh, I want to do it before I lose the student discount. So that's definitely a great example. Um, moving on to the next question. How did you really ever, I know we kind of touched on um, your careers earlier and how you got into it, but how did you originally enter the field and did you major in a green related subject? Like what was, what was your main inspiration for getting involved with this? Like what um, piqued your interest? Oh, I'm sorry. And to start, we can start with um, Mrs. Pastor. Yep. Uh, engineering background. Um, and I was really focused on energy efficiency. So when I started doing energy modeling and seeing how, um, not only from my experience in the, uh, as I mentioned before, doing a lot of island resorts and, and you, you don't, there's not a municipal water supply. We would build a reverse osmosis plant on the site to generate the water that was going to the building. So everything you did had to be done efficiently and at, at you know as and save as much energy as possible. So that really 
piqued my interest into um, getting involved in the field. And, you know, it just, it stemmed to going beyond the building and, you know, realizing I came from an engineering background, not that I ignored the site, but I didn't care. I, I didn't. I was, I was taught to calculate airflow and water flow through coils and, and, keep people cool and make people warm when it's cold outside. Um, so really when I saw the impacts to the environment, it just, it really made me just jump over and go all in. Awesome. Um, Dr. Sellers, would you like to answer? Sure. I, I touched on my background a little bit already, but um, just to give a couple other colorful examples, um, I was finding a lot of parallels in not only what I was studying and what I was interested in, but what moved me um, emotionally and things that I just had a visceral reaction to in general. Um, and when I was younger, I thought that being a psychologist meant that you could be a counselor, a psychiatrist, and those were your only options. And obviously, as I, um, for the myself in high school and looking into college realized there's a lot of other opportunities particularly in working with entire organizations which I thought was very useful and then eventually moving towards more of a design approach um, and in terms of environmental work something very similar I saw these bleeding heart environmental advocates and I thought that work was amazing but just like counseling it's something that I don't think I emotionally could handle doing long term so I um, had this garden path that ultimately landed me in a position where I can impact um, the environment in a way that I'd like to because I am passionate about it and also integrate my love for working with and in service of people in the psychology aspect, but in a way that doesn't make me cry every day, um, which when you have psychology students um, and even those working in the environment, the burnout rate can potentially be very high. So knowing yourself is really important. Um, and in my case, a lot of the work that I do is very quantitative and left brained, but I'm a very sensitive person. And so just knowing where my happy medium could be, where I had an impact I felt good about but could do for decades on decades um, was really ideal. And finding answers to a lot of questions I was really interested in. Um, I talk with some of my friends sometimes about uh, references that were made in pop culture and movies, documentary films, songs that were really a call to action. And my friends would say, yeah, this is great. And I said, okay, what are you gonna go do? And how long is that gonna last? And I was just really curious about it. And I got in a lot of debates about this. Um, when the movie Blackfish came out, we talked a lot about conservation and does exposure to marine wildlife and captivity mean in the long term you're really going to take action? And nobody had an answer for that. Those are the type of things I looked up in my research because I thought they were really interesting um, and woven directly to, you know, some of these other personal passions that I had in a way that, um, yeah, that fit me that I felt I could actually be of reliable service long term also. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Dr. Gilbert? So when I was um, uh, looking to enroll in college, um, I, I was interested in, in physics and biology, but realized that I, my math skills were not strong enough to be a physics major. So that kind of narrowed the choice down. And, uh, and then when I, I was looking for a specialization, and, uh, uh, UCF used to offer a, a lot of different uh, uh, biology majors. Uh, the one that struck me as being particularly interesting was one that we don't have on, at UCF anymore, and that was limnology. Uh, which is is the study of freshwater ecology, and I thought, you know, living in Florida and with the water resources we have, you know, that's going to be huge. The you know the study of freshwater ecosystems, and uh, and I really did enjoy it. And uh, uh, it, plus, it had the advantage that uh, when you go out to do field work, you're on a boat, so that was always you know you're you're wearing your shorts and you're on a boat, so that was always you know like the guys that were doing terrestrial ecology, they were out in the middle of a forest where it might be 94 degrees. I was on a boat. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but I really did enjoy that. There was a lot of things that were really interesting about that particular career of uh, uh, major choice. And uh, so went on for a master's. And like I said earlier, I, I graduated from UCF with a master's in biological science. And, 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 and that uh, allowed me to, to immediately move into a job as an environmental scientist with the state of Florida. So, so it was a, um, uh, 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 a good career choice for me because uh, uh, you know, I, again, I, I saw it as, as something that I was not only interested in int intellectually, but it gave me an opportunity to kind of do the sort of public service oriented work that I was interested in doing. I, I was not interested in going out and making a big, you know, killing in the stock market. You know, I was interested in, in a job, a career that would allow me to do something positive for, for, for the, the state. And, and uh, I felt like, you know, that, that turned out to be a good choice. Um, I'll just comment, um, you know, uh, 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 when I was introduced, you know, uh, I think it was JD noted that I was a, um, I'm now a, a geospatial professional, that the GIS is the primary thing I do. And, um, and back in, you know, the 80s when I graduated with my master's, 
Uh, GIS was just being invented. It was something that we really, most people didn't even know anything about. So uh, 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 a lot of people like me actually came to that career sort of through the back door. We learned that technology is a way to solve problems in the field we were in, which in my case by that time was environmental planning. And today, actually uh, pursuing a, a, you know, a, a, a a uh, education in uh, geography and GIS is an option that didn't exist uh, back when I was in college. Yeah, I'm definitely very grateful for the GIS program they have here now. I find it very interesting. All righty, and on to the next question, JD, if you want to. Oh, sorry. All right. So, what do green employers look for in your respective fields? Uh, we can start with Dr. Sellers. Okay. Um, thinking with my local government hat on, I would certainly say a passion for the topic. I'm sure that's why um, the vast majority, if not everyone is on this call today. So doing something that you love, that you're willing to pour your whole self into is incredibly important. And it shows certainly when we have interviews, um, whether or not individuals have worked in the space for some time or it's their first professional experience, um, you really get a sense for how invested people are in this space. So having someone who's really passionate, it's not um, always easy and um, not always a popular thing to do to be more sustainable. Um, and there's certainly a lot of challenges. So having the passion and dedication can really carry you through. And in terms of local government, also having um, some of those social skills to be able to relate and talk with people, um, whether it's residents in the community or business owners, um, everyone's trying to do the best that they can for themselves and meet their own goals and aims. And we need to find a way to align sustainability with some of those goals as well. If you're worried about keeping your lights on, you're probably not as concerned about what type of light bulb it is. Um, and so trying to find a happy medium with somebody um, in those space and find common ground is really important. And so having a sense of professionalism um, is also very important. I think uh, when I was working in a lab at UCF and was more in the academic space, I had more of an ability to be quirky, I would say. Um, and there's kind of an understanding that you're there for a reason and that you know your brains and ability will carry you through. Um, and in working in a space in local government, you don't have that kind of an assumption. You're there to be a civil servant um, and you're there in service of the public. Um, and you shouldn't assume that anyone knows anything about you. You need to prove that through your work and the way you self-present every day. Um, so I think that those are some key principles. Um, of course, an interest in policy uh, where the rubber really meets the road in terms of moving forward with some of these strategies. Not all of them are policies and requirements. Some of them are programs. Um, but getting a better sense in the difference uh, between what that looks like when something's implemented across an entire community. Um, and then finally, I'd say grant writing um, and grant application experience. If you have an opportunity to do that um, at some point when you're an undergraduate or in graduate school, um, it's great experience. I can't really think of a lot of scenarios where that wouldn't be useful, but especially in local government, a lot of our positions in our Office of Sustainability were originally created through a grant. Um, fulfilled through a grant. We weren't paid through the city. And then um, in some cases, a few of us, myself included, and even our director, Chris Castro, um, you know, superstar of sustainability, um, started as well in a grant funded position that ultimately the city was able to create a position to keep us on board. Um, so there's always a, you know, a great opportunity there to, um, you know, if you can get somebody to pay your salary for you and then um, impress them with the work that you're doing along the way, it's win-win for everybody involved. So um, I'd say that's a huge boon as well. Thank you, Brittany. Now, kind of switching heads, let's go to uh, Ms. Pastor since Brittany is in public and Ms. Pastor is in private. Yes, um, so passion, absolutely. You, you definitely need that because otherwise you're not gonna like what you do and it's gonna show in your work. Um, but from a more technical perspective, um, I, so I do work for an engineering firm and the engineering firm does building design. So you do have to have a background in um, that science, that technology, um, understanding how to design air handling units. We do lighting design, understanding how to design lighting controls and lighting systems for an energy efficient building, plumbing, fire protection, all of that um, from, uh, but I'm actually a small subgroup of our company and I have interior designers, architects, uh, civil engineers. I've got building automation control pro programmers that do commissioning. It's a very wide variety because sustainability means something different to everybody. And since my group focuses on sustainability, I need to be able to facilitate all that. So it's going to look different in each person's um, in each person's world. Um, but 
from a sustainability consultant perspective for like a lead consulting, well consulting, it's somebody who understands material specifications. It's somebody who understands how to do water calculations, understands the, you know, something as simple as calculating the occupancy type of a building and how many people you expect to be in there. Um, there is a very technical energy modeling side. So somebody who, um, you know, maybe you don't know how to engineer the building, but you're very good at simulation programs or inputting uh, data entry and, you know, stimulating a building and doing a 3D model of it to understand how moving the building by rotating it by 90 degrees on the site is going to change the sun angle coming into the windows. It might help you with shading. It might help reduce your energy. Um, so somebody who's really good at computer graphics, that's, you know, another kind of little niche area. And then, you know, the last side is this commissioning that I kind of mentioned, but um, it's going into buildings and making sure that systems are operating uh, efficiently. And I've got people who were true mechanical engineers, like touching gears and cogs and screwdrivers and somebody who knows how a motor or a pump actually works so that they can make sure it's working efficiently. Um, very, very wide area of expertise, but that's what, you know, that's what I look for in the private sector in my group. Awesome, thank you. And let's move on to Dr. Gilbrook. It's hard to add too much to those great answers from uh, um, uh, Amy Brittany. The, uh, uh, I think I want to take a different perspective. Instead of looking at uh, what are greener employers looking for, it's, it's really in many firms like the ones that Amy and I work for, the engineering and consulting firms, uh, they tend to have a matrix management approach, which means that uh, they don't have a really hierarchical uh, structure like uh, if you look at an old movie about uh, you know what business might have looked like in the 1950s or 60s where you know, everybody reports to their boss you know and everybody's wearing a tie you know and sitting at the desk with 600 other people sitting at desks. The modern consulting or engineering firm or planning firm tends to have people that are that have been hired for their technical expertise like Amy was talking about and then they're sort of put together in different teams depending on the situation. So it's this week you know, I'm working for these four people and next week I'm working with these three people and some weeks I'm the person in charge and some weeks I'm the person who's working for somebody else. The sustainability people at, at the engineering firm I work for largely are self-selected. They came into the company as, you know, wildlife biologists or as engineers, you know, uh, or, or you know, whatever their, their, their focus was. And then they looked around the company and they said, you know what, I'm really interested in what that sustainability team is doing over there. I want a part of that. And I'm gonna go introduce myself to those people and see if I can't become part of that team. Um, so I think as a student looking out at where do you wanna go after post-graduation, you wanna be looking for uh, uh, employers, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector that are doing the kinds of things you're interested in and that have the kind of culture that allows you to essentially work your way into that kind of environment. So that even if you don't actually get hired right off the bat as a you know, uh, sustainability uh, employee, that if you're gonna have the opportunity to you know, make yourself known as, hey, I'm interested in that and I'd like to be part of, of, of what's going on over there. Thank you all so much. And then for the next question, we're gonna skip that question because it's pretty similar just for the interest of time. So how would you describe your overall experience in your respective positions? And like, what is your favorite part about being in this field? Like, what do you think is like most gratifying? Oh, I'm sorry. And to start, we can start with Ms. Pastor. Oh, my overall experience is, you know, I, I spoke that uh, it was a risk for me getting into sustainability uh, all those years ago, but it was the best risk. It was the best thing I ever did in my life to raise my hand and, and, you know, really set the groundwork. I, you know, lead wasn't a, was, wasn't a thing. I keep saying that, but it, it was not on people's minds. I remember hearing every single day that lead is a fad. It's going away. Sustainability is a fad. It's going away who this leads thing, this green thing, nobody's going to care. And 
just being so passionate about it and having people that surrounded me that were as passionate about it as I was is really my favorite part too about this job. And I have been fortunate, to, my team has been together um, for, I think I've worked with the same people for 10 years. And because we just all have clicked so well and we, we just, when you meet somebody who is as passionate about energy, water, sustainability, efficiency as the people I work with, there is nothing better than getting up in the morning and, and just wanting to make a change and make a difference. I have seven nieces and nephews. I want them to breathe clean air. I want them to drink clean water and I want them to be able to have reliable electricity and actually turn the switch on and have something come on. And there aren't people who can say that that's possible for them. And we don't know what the future holds because we don't know how resilient and how reliable our grid is going to be. We don't know how our air is going to be. Um, so that to me is my favorite part about this job. Yeah, that's amazing. Definitely, very, definitely very noble. So thank you. Um, Dr. Gilbert. So my experience has been a little different than perhaps Amy's and Brittany's in that, uh, you know, my position is not strictly speaking about sustainability. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a uh, environmental planner, and I work on a lot of different uh, in, environmental type projects, of which one subset are the ones that we would think of as being sustainability projects. And those have become more common in just the last few years. But the um, uh, you know, working with a consulting firm, one of the great advantages of doing that, um, if you're interested in a, in a private sector uh, uh, kind of position, is the opportunity to work in a lot of different uh, uh, environments, a lot of different uh, uh, places. I've, I've worked in uh, most of the, the states in the union. I've not been to Hawaii, but I've been as far as Alaska. And uh, um, uh, I've worked on a lot of different projects. I've worked on water projects and transportation projects. Um, and uh, uh, right now working on a project in the Florida Keys on, on sea level rise and working on uh, the uh, electric vehicle master plan for the state of Florida. So, you know, th there's a lot of opportunity to work on a lot of different stuff. And that's one of the things that's been really great about uh, this field. Now, one of the things that was really great when I worked for government is that when you went to work every day, you knew that you were working for that agency and this was its jurisdiction and you knew everything you were going to do was in like those 12 counties or those six counties. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I really love that about my, my prior government experience is that you knew you were doing something to support that area to make life better for those people every day. Um, but the private sector experience I've had, I think, I think the, 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 uh, 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 the wide range of experiences uh, 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 and the diversity in the kinds of things I've done has been one of the big positives. And we're very grateful for your work here at UCF as well. Uh, Dr. Sellers? Um, I, I just love the work that I do and that I get to be a part of all the time. Um, I, there have been so many opportunities and so many circumstances over the last decade or I guess 12 years or so that I've been working in this space where I just have to check in and say, how did I get to do this? I'm so lucky. And I don't know how many individuals get to feel like that on a regular basis. Um, and that kind of buzzy excitement and nervousness that comes with doing things that are challenging and new and beyond your comfort zone um, is so exciting. And I think it's just, it's really valuable. So I hope that that's something that never changes. And with sustainability always being so cutting edge and there's always new technology, always new developments, always new improvements, um, just really making the world a better place. And that's the way that that's the future. You know, that's the way that we're going, call it sustainability or not. Um, and so it's just designing a better world for ourselves. Um, and whether that's forward thinking or doing things that are a little bit more intuitive um, and like the biophilia, like nature based to begin with, um, you know, looking back to kind of just the, the wisdom that already exists here. Um, there's a lot of opportunities just to tap into that, um, certainly to feel connected. Um, and like Amy mentioned, um, taking risks, including um, knowing when to, you know, take advice and to put it in its respective place. Um, and I, I certainly heard that when I was, an, I was interested in branching into sustainability and it wasn't related to anything else I was doing, but I was very passionate. I heard several times, it is a fad, it's a trend, don't pigeonhole yourself. And I was at least self-aware enough to know that I had a broad skill set. I was applying in different ways. And even if that was true, which I didn't believe, I knew that those skills would transfer to something else in the future. 
Um, and so I'm, you know, working on a lot more than sustainability ultimately over time. Um, in our case, it's civil service. It's a matter of doing city planning. It's a matter of understanding how things work at large. We're going to continue to need energy. We're going to continue to need water. We're going to need clean air. Those things aren't going to change regardless, um, you know, for generations to come. So I think um, that's been really beneficial just to have the insight and the drive and being around with some of those positive people um, to help kind of further your mission and your keep your motivation. And that's my favorite part of working in local government um, or all the other like-minded individuals who are there not to make money. Um, although some of the positions are not so bad actually in local government. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised to learn that more over time, um, but they're there to make a difference. They're there to serve and just to do something positive. And the type of people who are uh, drawn to that type of work are just really salt of the earth. I think wonderful human beings. And I'm so fortunate to get to go to work every day with a bunch of people who I genuinely respect and admire um, and have uh, you know, friendly and silly rapport with. Um, it's hard to work towards an existential crisis like climate change, um, but the people who do so tend to be very kind-hearted and hearty individuals. Thank you, Brittany. All right, our last question before we move on to student questions. What area of the green job market has the highest demand for emerging professionals with specific training? It can be any kind of training you want to mention. Uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Sellers. Uh, in our space, uh, specifically some of the areas that I work in, in terms of clean energy and green buildings, we're just seeing a huge uh, job market just continue to grow and grow in terms of renewable energy at large. Um, in Florida, that's largely solar energy. And I think there's an estimate that for every solar installation job, there were 16 individuals involved. So it's not just the boots on the roof in terms of installation, but of course there are the engineers, there's the individuals working on um, modeling and simulation, um, on the software development side of things, the salesperson. I mean, there's so much work that goes into it. So there's an incredible amount of opportunities in that space. We're also seeing electric vehicles really take off. Um, we're needing to provide that infrastructure across the city. We're uh, training dealerships to provide better information. So um, EVs are not just marketed to those who come in and say, I want an EV, but just to anyone looking for a car um, and providing better information. We're also transforming the rental car industry um, with that type of program and offering perks um, with that as well. Um, food recovery is also a big theme that we're seeing. So not only composting um, and not only providing opportunities uh, to divert food from the landfill, but also provide some of that food to communities in need. Um, and so that's something that we're working on really heavily with the city, but we're starting to see similar programs emerge in the private sector and across other cities as well. And then the last one um, I learned recently is beekeeping. Uh, we all know that the pollinators need as much support as they can, um, but I had no idea how incredibly vast the job market for beekeeping is and that there's a growing demand for it and actually a lack of trained individuals um, currently to meet that demand. Um, so something interesting, we actually have an educational program we're doing for the first time in the city of Orlando um, with an organization called Black Bee Honey, which is based out of the Paramore community. And we're training young entrepreneurs to not only learn how to sell um, the honey, but also to uh, work at beekeeping as well and have a skill that they can take to the job market. And some of those jobs are quite well paying. And from what we hear, anyone who kind of dabbles in that space just absolutely loves it. And it becomes not only their career, but a passion and a hobby of theirs also. Awesome, and kind of side tangent, black bee honey's honey is really good. All right, moving on to Dr. Gilbrick. I, building on what uh, uh, Brittany has just said, uh, uh, in the uh, in engineering and environmental consulting field, uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, uh, career choices that one could take uh, uh, to work in the sustainability field because it it is such a multidisciplinary um, um, kind of thing. Uh, you know, if, if I look at the people that are working on climate change action plans, for example, in our company, uh, we have the meteorologists who are doing the modeling to, to look at, you know, what is going to be the change in uh, uh, precipitation and, uh, and, and uh, average annual temperatures as a result of climate change. Uh, and you have the coastal engineers who are having to do the modeling for what is going to be the effect of um, changes in, in storm surge as a result of climate change and sea level rise. And then you've got the folks like uh, Amy was talking about earlier, who are looking at from the standpoint of, um, you know, what are you going to have to do with the infrastructure and the and the and the the building efficiencies uh, and the and the the vehicle efficiencies for the fleet that you're trying to operate. Uh, so there's a lot of different 
um, uh, uh, fields that that are all necessary in order to come together to 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 do something like a a climate change uh, plan. And uh, I, I don't know that I, I I can identify for you any specific field that uh, that works. I'd say that you know perhaps your best approach is to you know take the field that you're most uh, um, the thing that you are most passionate about, and then figure out how to apply that towards a sustainability job. Uh, you know, figure out what it is you're interested in doing, and look for places where you can apply that. Very true. Very true. All right. Let's move on to Ms. Pastor. I'm going to piggyback on both of them because really what we're seeing in our industry is uh, there's not enough infrastructure for the future that we expect of electric vehicles. So it's going to be anywhere from electrical engineers to people pulling the conduit and making sure that the electrical infrastructure is there to the people installing the power plants, whether it's a renewable power plant or it's batteries or microgrids to make sure there is electricity to power those vehicles. Um, there's going to be more green vehicles being built. So you're gonna need people who are specialists in automotive. It's, it's trickle down effect. Um, I think Dr. Gilbert said it best is find your passion and maybe relate sustainability to it and then figure out where that, uh, where that fits in. Awesome. Thank you all for your wonderful answers. That completes uh, our questioning portion of this panel. And now we're going to move on to the audience questions. So I noticed a few of you very asked questions before we start taking them, um, like you're in the very beginning, which is very cool. So I'm just going to go ahead and read some of those. And then some students have also asked to ask the questions themselves. So if we have enough time, hopefully we can get through all of them. Um, so the first question is from Shane Rampersad. And I'm hoping Sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. Um, what is currently being done to implement the infrastructure of chargers for electric vehicles? What is the best way we as students can promote this important message for the in infrastructure and get involved in breaking ground for this important structure? Well, let me start. I think I think uh, Dr. Sellers might have a lot to say about what can be done at the local government level because there's a huge amount that local governments can do for this. But uh, it just so happens that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I'm working right now as part of uh, 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 the, uh, the, the team that's working with the Florida DOT on the statewide uh, electric vehicle master plan. So this is a um, interagency uh, approach. So we have the DOT and several other state agencies, plus the, the, the folks from uh, uh, the power companies and from the charging, the, the, the folk when you see charge point and, and those other electric vehicle chargers that uh, uh, you can charge at, um, those are, they're also represented on this team. Um, my specific role on that is to use GIS to try to identify uh, the gaps in the existing electric vehicle charging network to see where there should be investments uh, by both the public and the private sector uh, to put new, uh, what they call EVSEs, electric vehicle servicing equipment, which you think of as chargers. Um, you know, where should those go? So that's my role, but we also have a number of other professionals that are looking at things like how is the, uh, the, the market demand for electric vehicles changing over time and the like. So, so there is a statewide plan, and then um, uh, hopefully that that will influence a lot of the decisions made at the county and city level going forward, as well as decisions at the state level. Uh, as to the other questions about what you can do individually, um, uh, you know, there's there's some individual choices one can make, including um, you know uh, uh, when when it's time for you to buy a vehicle when you reach that point, um, uh, you know uh, consider buying an electric vehicle, um, you know a, as opposed to uh, uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle because uh, you know that's the way the fleet is is headed in the future and uh, every electric vehicle on the road is going to dramatically reduce the emissions going into the air. So um, I'll stop there and see what the other panelists want to say. Dr. Gilbert, you were correct. There are a number of initiatives that we're working on in the city of Orlando. Um, part of that is expanding EV charging infrastructure across our city uh, facilities and our city properties. So anywhere where we have a park or a community center, even at the police station, at our fire stations, um, there's an opportunity to those highly visible areas that the community is familiar with um, to have the opportunity to charge working with the business community. And I think that the rental car incentive program is just so interesting. Um, this is something that's been in the works for years, uh, but I think it's Hertz and Enterprise who have programs uh, where if you choose to rent an electric vehicle, you get free front row parking at Disney. 
So not only does that save 25 or $30, you don't have to get on the tram or anything. You're right there at the front, which is amazing. Um, you get uh, first access parking at some of the resorts, uh, discounts on things as well. Everybody is interested in that. And those cars tend to be rented out far in the future, months out. Um, so it's been an incredible success and we're looking to expand things like that. I think that speaks to the local hospitality and tourism driven environment that we are in Orlando. We have the largest rental car market in the world. So that's a way to certainly influence that and get Getting individuals behind the wheel is one of the single largest factors uh, that will determine whether or not they'll consider an EV in the future. Most people have just never even been in one because they haven't considered it. Um, in terms of supporting the infrastructure across the way, we're moving forward with the consideration of an EV ready policy. Um, so looking at different types of businesses of different size on those commercial properties, not only in terms of providing incentives to green building development um, and EV ready development, but also requiring that that conduit is um, lied in advance because it's so much more expensive once a property has been built to then retroactively add that there. And we know that the demand already exists and it's only going to grow. So making those properties ready to install EV charging as it makes sense for them. Um, and what you can do to support that is reach out to your local government, whether or not it's the city of Orlando or you live in Orange County, make your voice known, figure out when they have their city council or board of county commissioner meetings, how you can put in a public comment. And it's an email that you can send. You can uh, show up. Most of those meetings are still virtual. Put in a request to speak and say, I'm really in support of this, or I see what the city is doing or what's been done at UCF. I want to see more of this. How can we make it happen? Um, and you're a constituent, your voice carries a lot of weight. And so hearing things like that um, really goes a long way in terms of influencing change over time um, and just figuring out what's being done in your local community and when it's most appropriate uh, to kind of strike while the iron's hot with those messaging. If you reach out to anybody in local government and ask what they're doing and how you can be of support, they'll point you in the right direction. And the only thing I'll add is that typically we're a consultant to either of those groups. So what we're gonna do is promote um, or do the design for the infrastructure. Um, if we're a sustainable consultant and going after a green rating system that uh, has a point value associated with implementing green vehicles, we'll drive those decisions, we'll weigh um, payback analysis versus, you know, is it the right thing to do? Uh, is the infrastructure available? Do we need to lay it out? And then we'll work with either local governments or uh, local utilities to make sure that the services are there when we do get the building built. Awesome. So we have uh, some some more questions as well from Madison Alpert. What are some online job boards or resources where students interested in environmental professional jobs can find internships related to the field of their choice? And you don't all have to answer. Um, to keep things brief, let's just whoever wants to answer first can have the question. Don't all speak at once though, right? <laughs> Yeah, this might be one that's better done as uh, we could probably submit some uh, some websites and, and you might be able to distribute them to the to the participants later on, JD. Because uh, right off the bat, you know, I, 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 the 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 uh, eighty seven character URL uh, kind of escapes me, so I, I think maybe we. I'll say LinkedIn. I, I'm very, very vocal on LinkedIn, and I know our company posts a lot of job uh, postings on LinkedIn, as do others. Um, so that is one professional social media site that I would recommend for people to look at. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And we do I utilize Handshake, which I realize uh, was a bit of a channel into this exact panel today. Um, so the city of Orlando has their own account. Our Office of Sustainability is a sub account within that, but you can certainly search across those jobs we post whenever anything's available. And kind of in theme with some of the comments I made earlier, don't be afraid to reach out to organizations. And if you can't find something posted, say, hey, I'd love to get my name on a list of individuals who are interested, should opportunities to volunteer, intern, or work for you come up in the future. Um, and I think it's, you know, again, just an opportunity to get ahead of the curve. Hello there. Do you mind if I proceed to ask some questions, JD? Um, let me go through a couple other questions that are fairly quick and then I'll turn it over to you. Of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. From Simone Daniels, um, for all three of you, from your own personal experience and area of knowledge, what advice would you give to individuals in regards to creating and living a more sustainable life? Oh, I need to, sh I'm jumping in here because I t love this story and I will keep it as brief as possible. I am, I'm a runner. I 
love, I get up really early in the morning and I love to run. And when you're up really early in the morning, you see people's garbage on the side of the road. So I run through my neighborhood and I wear gloves. Um, but I make sure that my community properly recycles. So if I see something in somebody's recycling bin that should not be in the recycling bin, I pull it out and put it in the trash. And it's education. It really comes down to education. And if I see somebody up in the morning and I'm not, I'm not afraid, I stop and I'm like, hey, this doesn't go in the recycling bin because by the way, you are going to contaminate everything in this recycling bin. So when in doubt, throw it out. But that's what I say, to live a more sustainable life, educate yourself and educate others. I would say ask yourself what's holding you back. Um, I think that especially amongst those who are on this call, we're all quite aware of some of these opportunities and we all have our hangups. I have them too. Um, and sometimes just asking, is it a lack of education? Is this something that you can talk to someone who has um, a little bit more experience or something you can just Google? Um, it's incredible the amount of things that you could answer within under five minutes, but you just you know constantly refer back to, I don't really know, so I haven't done it. Um, is it effort? What's a way that you can make it easier for yourself or is there an easier option that already exists um, and then if it's a question of strategy is this the right way to go about doing something again just talking with somebody else who's like-minded who's already done it guidelines online just taking a second to realize why you're hesitating uh, that's kind of the psychologist in me uh, just thinking of those things it's sometimes we do those things for comfort so we don't have to change um, but if you go through your house and you're thinking of the food that you're eating the waste that you're producing the way that you're using energy and water um, we all know some of the things that we should be doing and just ask yourself why you're not doing them and how you can kind of overcome that hurdle awesome um so next um connor dirk said he'd prefer to ask this question so i'm gonna go ahead and unmute and he can go ahead and ask thanks um so my question is actually more for uh, dr gilbrook um Earlier in the Zoom call, you said that more people are kind of leaning towards living in major cities uh, where you can walk to you know, your local grocery store and stuff like that and not have to drive. You know, the idea is it can be more sustainable. Um, uh, lately, there's uh, the past couple of weeks, there's actually been quite a few articles from places, uh, from news places such as like New York Times and Wall Street Journal, um, saying that there could be a mass exodus of people leaving major cities and moving out to suburbs or even further than that. Um, I guess my question is for you, how could that affect sustainability in major cities if there's multiple, if there, you know, there's lots and lots of people leaving? Uh, and overall, how could that affect uh, sustainability? Yeah, I, I think that's a really disturbing trend. And, and my hope is, and I think a lot of professionals are hoping that, that this is uh, not in fact going to become a trend in the sense that it's, it's, it's uh, going to be long-term or, 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 or uh, permanent, that this is a, a kind of an immediate reaction to the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, there's bound to be some you know, uh, problems with, uh, uh, you know, as, as companies that are, that are and, I, and I mentioned companies because it's employers really kind of drive this. If you've got employers that are downtown and they find it's not sustainable to be paying lots of rent being downtown and they tell everybody work from home and they close their office, well, now that means that all the other little uh, places downtown like the, the, the Thai restaurant and the, the ice cream shop and the shoe shine shop that used to rely on people working downtown, they all go out of business because you know, the, the sheer number of people working downtown is, is, is diminished. I'm hopeful that that is not a permanent trend that once the crisis with, with COVID is passed that we will see people return to downtown because of all the positive advantages it has both personally and, and, and from a business standpoint, as well as from a sustainability standpoint. Um, but, uh, but it's an issue. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a good answer, Connor, to, to your question, because it's sort of up in the air as to how long is this health crisis gonna last? And, and as a consequence, you know, how, uh, how much effect is it gonna have on, on uh, uh, the, the uh, viability of, of, of cities? Right, yeah, I wasn't looking more for like an exact answer, I was more so asking like opinion, just because I'd heard you mention that earlier and I yeah. can't really think about some yeah. stuff, so thank you. Okay, I, I will mention for everybody on the call that there's a really great book about the sustainability of cities versus suburban environments called Green Metropolis by a fellow named David Owen. I strongly recommend it. Uh, uh, it uh, 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 demolishes a lot of the preconceptions you might've had about 
you know, gee, it seems like uh, being in downtown New York City, what an urban wasteland. Well, in fact, Manhattan may be one of the most environmentally sustainable places on the North American continent uh, when you look at water usage and greenhouse emissions and some other metrics. So um, uh, strongly recommend that one. All right, thank you. And we have another question from Rodney Graham for Amy. You mentioned your work with resorts and hotels. How has your job worked to improve ecotourism and the impact that it has to people indigenous to those lands? That's a great question, thank you. Um, we, um, it's really helped um, and it has really um, brought a lot of vitality, sustainability, and actually has, has promoted growth in the economy for a lot of the regions, depending on where, where the region is. So we have done some, you know, as a, as a consultant, we have done some work locally for ecotourism, uh, Wakaiva Island. I don't know if many of you are familiar with that, but um, Wakaiva Island has a fantastic sustainability plan. Uh, they have a classroom on the site that is lead platinum. They use uh, the lake as the cooling element. So they have a heat exchanger submerged in the lake that actually cools the building itself. Um, and we helped get that certification. We also have done a lot with the site and the owner of Wakaiva Island actually works at our company. So he's very passionate about, and we support local business and go there for a lot of our events. Um, when you start looking at some of, and I'm gonna focus kind of solely on the island work that I've done because that's really where it has had the biggest impacts. Uh, we were working on a project in Hopetown, which is in the Abacos uh, in, the in the Bahamas. And if many of you remember what happened with Hurricane Dorian, uh, kind of swept through and, and really demolished a lot of that. But prior to the hurricane, we were working to develop an entire plot of land and we were going to build an eco resort on it. It was gonna be all sustainable measures. It was gonna to try to be net zero. Um, and when Dorian came through, it, I mean, obviously there was a lot of impacts, but what came out of that was actually this, this project called Hopetown United. I encourage you guys to look online for it. And we're going to actually use that little little idea that we had for a, a, an eco resort and a destination you know resort that everybody could go to to actually expand it and make hope town more resilient and more sustainable and more reliable so that something like that never happens again um, so a lot of good has come out of the things that we've done um, for the environment in these little island areas Awesome. And so next we have Ethan Hudson would like to ask a question. So I'll go ahead and meet up through. Hi there. Uh, I have a question and it pertains to uh, a book I had recently read by Cal Newport. Uh, his book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. He suggests that there are three qualities that makes a job great, uh, creativity, control, and impact. Working in sustainability definitely has impact and a lot of your guys' jobs, especially in consulting, seem to have uh, creativity and control. He suggested that these three things are rare and valuable and that they take some sort of trade either through trading experience or maybe lack of pay or, or other benefits or job outlook. From your guys' experience, has there been a sort of uh, any sort of negative trade-off or uh, I guess a, a second uh, question would maybe be is sustainability work something more for people in the senior levels of their positions where they do have experience that they can trade in? Is it something that someone in their entry level can really break into? Yeah, I'll, let me jump in on that first. So my answer to that last part of your question, Ethan, would be no. Uh, at my company, anyway, we have people at all levels, you know, very senior people, but also people that are right out of school contributing to sustainability projects. It all kind of comes to sort of what uh, uh, Amy Pastor mentioned earlier, you know, you need to come in with a technical skill set mm -hmm. that is meaningful. But if you come in, you know, to the company with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a technical skill set that's valuable to a particular team and you've got the right, you know, uh, uh, attitude, uh, you're going to be welcomed into the team and you can be a big contributor, even if you've only been with the company for two months. Uh, and then, of course, you've got people at, you know, all various, you know, more senior levels that are that are participating in these efforts. So, so I'd say uh, uh, no, that, that seniority is not an issue. Also, the trade-offs between uh, creativity, control, and uh, and contribution. Uh, you know, one 
one of the things, at least in, in the American economy, that the people with the, the least amount of control over their jobs tend to be, unfortunately, the people that are doing service work, you know, that are, you know, working in a restaurant or working at Publix, you know, and, and they don't have a lot of control over when they work or, you know, what kind of work they do. You, by virtue of the fact that you're all going to graduate with, with college degrees, you're going to immediately have a big you know, advantage in that the kind of work that you're going to go into is largely going to be of that more creative type where you're going to have more agency. You know, your, your boss isn't going to so much order you to do something as say, hey, we're doing this and we want you to do this part of it. You know, are you up for that? Because this is what I need out of you. You're going to have a little bit of uh, latitude as to uh, how you deliver. Now, you're going to be held accountable for delivering, but, you know, you're not going to be given a rigid specification, like I need it done within these hours, you know, on these days, like you would if you were working at Burger King. So um, I'll stop there and see if anyone else has a contribution. I don't know if that helped, Ethan, was that? I know that, I, I appreciate that, Dr. Okay. Gerbrook, I appreciate it, thank you. The only thing I would add to that is just, um, you know, really hard work and conscientiousness and diligence, um, again, just, um, you know, proving that you have this incredible value that you would like to add um, and that you're willing to step up to the plate, go above and beyond, really contribute, be a team player, but have something unique that you want to add to it as well, um, which is going to give you more agency to have more control over things in the long run. You've just got to demonstrate it first. So being willing to go through all of those things and um, whether you're entry level at a more senior level, have a sense of humility because there's always something new to learn and there's always something new and exciting and emerging coming out of this field. Um, so I don't think any of us will ever establish a level of expertise yeah. that is just going to kind of continue and be stable forever. You've always got to be nimble. And so just being mindful of that as well. Yeah, true. That's true. And your generation has so much to offer. And I have learned more in the last probably three years just by reading some of the things. It's always, I think it was uh, Dr. Stellar saying that, you know, technologies are always evolving and it's true. What you read yesterday is different today. So just keep Raise your voice, raise your hand, raise your voice, and make sure you speak and be heard. All right, thank you all. Um, let's turn it over to Silva, who wanted to ask the question. Okay, go ahead. Hello there, everybody. I hope you're all well today. So I have two questions, and both of them are hopefully going to be relatively brief. Um, the first one is, of course, for the panel. So I'm participating with a team of engineers in something called the Solar Decathlon. One, have you heard of the Solar Decathlon? And two, would any of you be interested in advising our team of six mechanical engineers? So we're very lopsided um, towards that in terms of um, advising us, because clearly you're here because you appreciate students and you want to guide us towards sustainability. And the Solar Decathlon is, of course, really intertwined with that. Would any of you be interested in contacting me and um, kind of getting together? And if so, here's my email and here's the Solar Decathlon website. I'm very familiar with it and I cannot personally just because of time commitments and but I I can get you in touch with some people and I will ask them for you still because it's a great competition. Thank you very much. And now there's a second question and it goes out not just to the panelists, but all of you. Um, you see the solar decathlon is incredibly broad, touching topics from marketing to business to everything um, that you can imagine in terms of designing a building. Do some of you want experience in working on a team with the solar uh, in participating in the solar decathlon? Because essentially what I'm looking for is I'm looking to make this an interdisciplinary team of people who maybe want experience in marketing, in business. And it gives you an opportunity to tell a story um, when you want to go into sustainability and maybe tell the story of how you participated in this Department of Energy contest. Um, would any of you be interested in that? And if so, please contact me um, at that email. And if you are not sure, please look over the Solar Decathlon website. We're going to be participating in the design challenge. So we're not going to be building a physical building, but we um, are going to be doing the design challenge. And just for reference, this team is, um, 
uh, the engineering senior design team that has been constructed. Um, and so this is an opportunity for you to join six mechanical engineers who don't, who have essentially this challenge to face and join us in facing this challenge of sustainability together, essentially is my pitch to all of you. Um, and if any of uh, you on the panel thinks that would be a great opportunity for students, please speak up and tell them that it would be a great opportunity because I've been trying to get people on board to participate in this and it's like pulling teeth to um, get people on board to um, participate in this experience. Thank you so much for your all time. And I hope that was brief enough, uh, JD. I know you have a lot of questions to go and I appreciate it. You're fine. Thank you for your time as well. All right, Emma, I think you have the next question ready. Yep, and Silva, I'll be more than happy to work with you. I'll put my student government email if you wanna get in contact. Um, for the next question, sorry, I lost it here. Um, Melanie Brady wanted to ask a question, so you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, uh, so I was curious, what can I do as a computer scientist to help out with sustainability and energy optimization? What in your fields have you guys experienced that would be the most helpful? And um, if there's any means that you'd recommend for finding mentorship with it, I'd appreciate hearing that as well. There's certainly a lot of work to be done in that space. Um, in a lot of cases, there are nonprofits or government agencies who are developing and managing their own websites or platforms, and they could use a lot of help. Some of those are not the most efficient or intuitive at all. It's just due to a lack of funding or opportunities. Um, so I think there's some great consulting potential experiences there that you could possibly tie in with your studies. Um, a lot of it is seeing real-time information, getting feedback, having interactive um, spaces where you can see energy use in real time, for example, whether it's within a given building, across a set of uh, portfolio of buildings, across an entire city. Um, I mentioned earlier about improved sustainability metrics, and there's no lack of opportunities to better visualize those. Um, there, is, there are opportunities um, for mapping, of course, and for GIS as well, but um, really integrating a lot of this complex information and uh, better explaining it um, to the layperson or to the public or other stakeholders and decision makers are some of the key areas where um, I know of a few computer scientists who've really made some excellent contributions in that space and uh, we need more of them. Second, I second that, that's my, my input. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. I think, I think that was a great answer. So I, I don't have anything to add to that. Yep. To add a little bit more onto that, I, I kind of had this little pet dream of doing like data analytics and work with energy optimization. And uh, a lot of what Amy Pastor was saying was pretty right on board with that. So um, I've been trying to find as much mentorship and direction on the right educational moves and the right internships to build up my resume as strong as possible. So thank you. I, I really appreciate your answer and time. Control, look at uh, controls uh, companies like Siemens or Automated Logic. Uh, I will tell you that the dashboard or what we call the, the dynamic plaque uh, that goes into buildings and shows the graphical energy usage um, are, can be pretty poor sometime. And to Dr. Seller's point, you know, if, if, if somebody, the layperson can read it, it helps them understand more and it gets them more interested. So Siemens, Automated Logic, Honeywell, any of those controls programs, programmers. And we do also in the city offer related internships. There are currently volunteer positions, um, but we do have internship positions specifically in the green, green oh man, end of the day, green energy, green buildings and clean energy. <laughs> I've worked in this Words space are for a hard. <laughs> Words are hard um, in that space as well, specifically dealing with data and working more and more towards um, utilizing those analytics to provide those visualizations. So um, if you're interested, feel free to contact me also. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I think that might be all the time we have. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in here. Uh, Morgan Kennedy to Brittany, Dr. Sellers. How do you think your psychology background specifically helps you in your career since she is also studying psychology at UCF? Oh, very cool. Um, it, it affects everything that we do. Um, I think I used to say something along the lines of until every 
piece of infrastructure that every human interacts with is a perfectly intuitively designed smart city element. We still need humans uh, to make these decisions. But in fact, even with smart and future ready city uh, endeavors that we're seeing across the board, um, those are humans who are making those decisions, humans that are designing those systems, humans that are uh, determining whether or not they want to implement them. Um, so whether it's in as something as micro as a meeting between just a handful of individuals to thinking towards a long term strategic policy planning um, to determining what's going to make the most sense for a certain group of people uh, to better be involved, whether it's from a transportation side, whether it's uh, implementing community gardens, whether it's uh, a more future thinking lead well designed building. Um, there's just it, we're humans, we're designing the world that we live in. And so um, I think it gives a lot of strong insight. Um, into a lot of those processes, into the decision making process, into how we think and perceive um, and make choices about the world that we live in, what we're doing individually, and to be able to better understand how individuals and organizations, countries make those decisions as well. Um, and um, I think it also adds an interesting element. I often refer to myself as kind of like a funky tool in the toolbox. Uh, most sustainability offices don't have a psychologist on staff, but I think it affords me a lot of opportunities for unique insight. Um, and if you're fortunate enough to have that sense of control, like one of the comments mentioned earlier, um, you get to have even more fun kind of like playing in the sandbox and adding an interesting perspective to things um, and utilizing that more. So if you're interested in psychology and sustainability, um, there are myriad ways to be able to combine those two in your future work. Awesome. Well, thank you all to our thank you to our panelists uh, for giving you for giving us your time today. Sorry, yes, words are hard. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And I hope that this was useful to all of the audience. Um, if you have if any of you have any questions or like have any ideas for um, future events like this, you can go ahead. I put my student government email in the chat, um, SGA innovation at UCF.edu. I'd love to do more things like this. And again, panelists, I am so grateful for your time. Um, have a great rest of your day, everybody. And I hope to see some of you soon.